What is up guys? This is the fourth part in our Kalman filter series. This series is all about building an intuitive understanding of the Kalman filter, then moving on to the formal derivations. And finally, we would also build a Kalman filter from scratch in code. But what are we doing in this video, you asked? After building an intuitive understanding of what a Kalman filter generally is in part one, followed by the alpha beta filter in part two, and then the base filter in part three, we are at a point where we have all the tools in our toolbox to understand what a Kalman filter is formally. So we go into the Kalman filter formally now with equations, derivations, and all that jazz. Now, a word about our sponsors. We don't have any, but this series is built in collaboration with Mateus Mentally. So Mateus and I together built this series on Kalman filter. There's a lot more to come on this channel from the both of us, and we will see you there. But right now, let's talk about the Kalman filter formally. If you were to summarize what we did in the previous videos, we understood what the Kalman filter is, of course. I'm not gonna go there again, but I am sure if you're watching this video, you have seen the previous videos. If you haven't seen the previous videos, please do check them out. You will build an intuitive understanding of the Kalman filter. You will have all the mathematical tools, for example, the alpha beta filter and the base filter to understand what a Kalman filter is formally. But speaking about it superficially now, a Kalman filter has two steps, predict and update. Predict is where you use an internal mathematical model to estimate what the state would would be at the next time instance and update is where you actually use sensor measurement values to correct that prediction and after update you get the final estimate of your state for that iteration how about we now go into the kalman filter formally so that we look at all the equations we understand what a kalman filter is mathematically before that let's look at an intuitive example because this entire series is built on top of intuitive examples instead of just throwing jargons and mathematical equations at you so Let's look at an example and we will continue from there. Before we formally introduce the Kalman filter in its probabilistic form, and that is the final aim of this video, let's put a pin on it and see a visual example of a discrete Kalman filter at work. We are using a discrete Kalman filter just for visual simplicity. Of course, the real world is not discrete, but this example drives the message home and you will be able to understand the Kalman filter in a very intuitive way. Once through that, we'd be able to appreciate the formal equations a lot more. Since the Kalman filter is essentially a state estimation tool, that's what we do here. We estimate the state, which in this example happens to be the robot position in a discrete world. Let's say we have a robot position in a long building corridor like the picture you see here. When moving forward, it is capable of guessing the distance moved, that would be your motion, and taking pictures of what's in front of it, that would be the observation. When it comes to the pictures, which is for your observation, you have a wall with different subsections having different colors. And these colors are what the robot sees, and that is your measurement. Let's start with how the Kalman filter works. You have predict and update steps in each iteration. These steps are very similar to what you've seen before in this series. In the first iteration, you first have your predict step. Since the filter initially has no idea about the robot's position, all discrete positions have the same probability. This would be the predicted position distribution, which would be the prior for this iteration. What you see here in black is your belief. And right now, all discrete positions have equal probabilities because as I said, the filter has no idea about the robot position. The next step in this iteration is the update step. The robot gathers its first measurement and observes the color of the wall. While there are nine color segments on the wall, it observes only one of them in the current position, right? The probability of measuring the colors given its position distribution is illustrated in red here. The prior distribution we had from the prediction of this step and probability of Z given X, that is measurement given the position, are combined in the step to get the new position estimate in black, which would be belief of X. So we combine P of X from the previous step, that is your predict step, with P of Z given X. We know mathematically what this means because this is like the base filter. You see your belief here. You have a higher bar in one of the positions that is based on the combination of your prior and your current measurement values. So that was your first iteration. Let's go to the second iteration. In your second iteration, the robot now moves forward and this control command shifts the belief about its position. So the belief you had towards the end of the first iteration is slightly changed because you also introduce motion now. The predict step will now use motion instead of the initial value because the initial value is just used once. When the robot moves, this probability distribution also sees a reduction in size of all the bars because this step also changes the position of the bars based on how much the robot has moved. That is your motion model. And you will see the length of these bars reduced because your motion model introduces uncertainty. So the probability distribution looks more flat because you are less sure about different positions now. 
Let's go to the update step in iteration 2. The robot now observes another color and it repeats the idea of estimating where the robot is in the environment based on this measurement. Like in the first iteration, probability of z given x has this red distribution again. But now the estimation starts to get even more interesting. Based on the prior, which is belief of x from your predict step and the current measurement, that is p of z given x, the current estimate in black has one of the bars longer than the other ones. In plain English, this outcome could be translated to there is one position that is more likely Given that the robot has observed the first color in the first iteration, then move forward and then it observed the second color right now. So now this measurement value in the second iteration makes the Kalman filter more confident about where the robot is. That's why you have a longer bar in your posterior, which is belief of X here. That is the result of your second iteration. Now, if you go to a third iteration, the robot moves forward again. So you propagate your belief of X from iteration two. And again, the length of the bar reduces because there is more uncertainty with motion. This goes on and on and on. But this example in general illustrates the big picture of the Kalman filter. Don't worry if you are not able to understand how to mathematically do this because we will go into the mathematics of this. But overall, this image summarizes all the steps we've seen. The initial condition is used as the input only for the first iteration in the prediction step. That estimates the prior. With sensor observations, the filter executes the update step estimating the posterior and that is your final state estimate for that iteration. This loop is repeated at every time instance as long as you want to compute the estimate. Additionally, the prediction step uses the previous estimate and control commands to estimate the prior and the uncertainty also increases in each step. That increase is as I said because the motion model introduces uncertainty. However, this uncertainty decreases when your posterior is computed because that's when you merge your sensor observations with your prior. Now that we have a more visual understanding of the Kalman filter, let's now finally get into the formal equations. In the previous part, we derived both predict and update equations for the base filter. They look like this. And now for a final trick, we see how introducing the two assumptions I was talking about in the previous video leads to further solving the base filter equations and turning them into the Kalman filter equations. But what are the two assumptions we talked about in the previous video? Again. Kalman filter is equal to base filter plus the assumption of all the distributions being Gaussian and all your models, your motion model and your prediction model being linear or linearized. In scenarios where these two assumptions are strongly valid, the Kalman filter is the best possible estimation tool. So we wish to, let's say, estimate the position of a robot over time where the motion model and your observation models are linear and all distributions are Gaussian. We only need the Kalman filter. As a side note, the real world is not as simple and nothing is perfectly Gaussian or linear. So the Kalman filter may not be the optimal solution in those cases, but that is not what we are focusing on right now in this series. Coming back to our base filter equations from the previous video, here are our predict and update steps. How about we now introduce these two assumptions I was talking about mathematically. Let's start with the first assumption of linearity. We want to introduce that in the two equations we see right now in our base filter. As we said, the Kalman filter assumes a linear motion and observation model. Hence, we can represent our motion model and our measurement model with the following equations. These are linear equations, right? Let's analyze these two equations properly. The first equation says that your new state is equal to matrix A of t times the previous state plus a matrix B of t times the odometry or motion command, that is U of t. The last term actually represents the noise associated with the motion. If you did not have that noise, your world would be ideal and you would actually never even need a Kalman filter. So because the world is not ideal, you have that noise and that noise is taken care of here. The two matrices A and B allow us to compute the current state given the previous one and the control command. As we can describe this operation with matrices, we have a linear function here. Of course, this is multidimensional because your state won't be just a one dimensional value. It will be a vector here. Let's say you're working in a 2D space, so it could be X and Y. In 3D, it would be X, Y, and Z. Let's also have a linear representation of your measurement model. This is your representation for your measurement model. Here, C of T is again a matrix allowing us to obtain the expected observation Z of T given the known current system state X of T. In other words, given that we know where the robot is and what the world looks like, we can calculate what we should observe. In this equation, this variable again represents sensor noise because no sensor is perfect. If you had a perfect sensor, again, you would not need a Kalman filter. So we have your linear representation of your motion model and your measurement model. Both of them, of course, also account for noise. So at this point, we have introduced the assumption 
of linear motion and observation models. Let's also now introduce the second assumption. All distributions are Gaussian. To introduce the assumption of Gaussian distributions in our base filter equations, we first need to describe what a generic multivariate Gaussian distribution is. And this is what it is mathematically. A generic multivariate Gaussian distribution here is characterized by two parameters, the mean and the covariance. The mean is a vector with the same dimensionality as the state, which is x. The covariance is a quadratic matrix that is symmetric and positive semi-definite. Its dimensions equals the dimensionality of the state squared. So if your state vector is of the dimension n, your mean will have the same dimensionality, so it would be n, and your covariance would be n cross n. To introduce this assumption, let's model all probability distributions in our base filter equation as Gaussian. And while we're at it, let's also use our linear equations. So we would combine both the assumptions right now. As a reminder, these are the two equations in your base filter. If you look at these two equations, we essentially need to describe the following two distributions for the motion model and the observation model. Because what remains apart from this is belief of x of t minus 1. And because this is a recursive filter, you get this from the previous iteration. So you just need to solve for these two probability distributions. Let's represent these two probability distribution with our two linear assumptions. The first one is for your motion model, right? So this is what your motion model would look like if you introduce the two assumptions. One is for your Gaussian distribution and the second one is for your linear model. Please compare it with the standard multivariate Gaussian distribution equation. Here your mean is a of t into x of t minus 1 plus bt into u of t. That is because the last part, which is your noise factor, is used in r of t. So r of t represents your noise factor. And without noise, you will just have your mean, right? So that is what we do. This is the final representation of your motion model after you introduce the two assumptions. RT here describes the motion model noise. Similarly, let's represent our observation model with these two assumptions. Your observation model is P of Zt given Xt. And this is your representation. Here Q of t describes the measurement noise. And I'm sure after looking at the linear equations, you know what I'm talking about here. The mean of your measurement is Ct into Xt. Okay, so we have a representation of both these probability distributions in your base filter. So how do you combine them to build your Kalman filter? Here's the trick. If you substitute probability of xt given ut and xt minus 1, that was your motion model, and probability of zt given xt, that was your measurement model, with the linear Gaussian models we showed and solved further, the two base filter equations undergo massive simplification. That's precisely because both these equations combine two Gaussian distributions. And the combination of two Gaussian distributions is also Gaussian. That means your belief hat x of t and belief x of t are also Gaussian distributions. And this simplifies your computation so much since a Gaussian distribution is characterized by its mean and covariance, we need the mean and covariance of belief hat x of t and belief x of t. The mean and covariance of belief x of t is what we finally need for the iteration, right? Because that represents a final estimate for time instance t. Well, solving this base filter equations for the substitution is a long exercise, but if you do, these are the final values of both mean and covariance sets. Or you can just trust us with this, but if you're super inclined mathematically, you can substitute these two probability distributions in your base filter with the two mathematical models we showed for the motion and your uh, measurement uh, model and see what happens. You will finally get these equations. This is the algorithm of your Kalman filter and we effectively build this. We got to this point from the base filter. The first two lines are for calculating mu t hat and sigma t hat that represents the prediction step. We take the motion command u of t the previous state of the system, mu of t minus 1, and predict the new mean. The predicted covariance matrix, sigma t hat, is also computed based on the previous covariance, that is sigma t minus 1, plus the uncertainty we add through the motion noise, that is rt. Hence, we always said the uncertainty increases here because motion adds uncertainty here. Now, we just see it mathematically. The next three lines are for calculating mu t and sigma t. That represents the correction step. kt might be perhaps new to you. It is called the Kalman gain. It trades off how certain we are about observations with respect to the motion. Let's also be slightly more intuitive about the Kalman gain. For example, imagine that we have a perfect sensor and that the measurement noise matrix Qt is zero. If we apply this to compute Kt and then compute mu t, we will end up with a result that says we erase all the previous predictions and only the observation remains as we trust it completely. If we do otherwise with Qt close to infinity, Kt will be zero. 
and applying kt to the next line, you will end up with mu t is equal to mu t hat, which means that the uncertainty of the sensor was so high that the measurement did not provide any information at all. Instead of me showing this part mathematically, it would be very beneficial if you try it out to build an intuition of k of t. It is very simple. You either set qt to zero or qt to infinity and see what the Kalman gain does to the mean value. After you do this, it will be evident that the Kalman filter computes a weighted mean between the prediction and the observation. So what is our final result in each iteration? Mu of t and sigma t, and they represent the mean and covariance of our state estimate for time instance t. Since you only need the mean and covariance, to actually represent a Gaussian distribution, you actually have your Gaussian distribution for your state estimate, right? You have the final result for the iteration. As a side note, if you've seen part two of the series, which was all about the alpha beta filter, you would remember that we had something called alpha and beta. These were two values. The Kalman gain essentially encodes alpha and beta values, but they aren't hard coded anymore and are recalculated in every iteration. So see, everything we've discussed in this series is coming together now. This was a mathematical idea of the Kalman filter. I hope these equations are much more clear to you right now. We started with the base filter, which was a continuation of the previous video. And then we introduced the two assumptions. After introducing the assumptions, we solved our base filter equations to get the final Kalman filter equations. And this is your Kalman filter. We have finally built the Kalman filter from scratch mathematically. As a summary up until now, we have a good understanding of what a Kalman filter is formally. The Kalman filter is built on top of the base filter. Base filter plus two assumptions equals the Kalman filter. We've seen what it means mathematically. And now in the next video, we will build a Kalman filter from scratch in Python. We will use a one dimensional example for that right now. And let's see how that works out. Okay, so I will see you in the next video of this series. I hope this video and even this series was useful to you. We'd love to know what you think because we spend a considerable amount of time building this series and in general, everything on this channel. So any words, any feedback is always appreciated. If you think this series is useful and you think others can benefit from it, please do share. So I hope you do that and I will see you in the next video. Bye-bye.